Hey everybody, welcome here to Pop Culture Philosophers. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups, and today we're going to be talking about my top 10 comic books of the week for March 18th. Comics actually got to be released yesterday, on Tuesday, on St. Paddy's Day. So that's pretty nifty. Some people got their books early, some people got them today, some people won't get them at all, some people are going digital. Um, lots of craziness in the air. That's one of the reasons why we're doing this live tonight. Just wanted to touch base with everybody, so I'm going to go right into my top 10 comic books of the week. And then we will continue on live and uh, do like a AWA and, wait, what is that? AMA, what, whatever, you know, a Q&A, whatever. We'll just go old school. Anyway, um, so without much further ado, these are my personal top 10 favorite comic books of the week. These are the ones that I really highlight. This was a hard list because I read 47 comic books. Um, and there were a lot of good ones, a lot of indie books this week. The indies definitely dominated, but if I had to give it to one in, like one publisher in particular, it would probably be Boom, just for a bunch of great books coming out, and also maybe um, AWA, Upshot. They uh, actually had a very strong debut this week as far as quality goes. So, without much further ado, my top 10 comic books of the week. Number 10, Archangel, number 8 from AWA Upshot. That's right, AWA Studios, Upshot Comics. This is a whole new line of comics. They got four books that launched this week, Archangel 8, Resistance, Hotel, and Red Border. I pretty much thought all four were pretty decent. I thought Red Border is probably the weakest. Archangel 8's really good, it's gritty. If you like books like Punisher, I highly recommend that you check this one out. It's written by Michael Morisi. It's got artwork by C.P. Smith. The artwork is gritty. The book itself is a little grim. It's about uh, so it's about an angel who's kind of like an assassin, right? Or at least maybe that's what the solicitation says. The book, you don't I don't know if you necessarily pick up on what exactly is going on through the first read through of this book, but the artwork's amazing. This is definitely in the vein of something like The Punisher, um, but not like when The Punisher became an angel. Do you remember that? That was interesting stuff. Am I super fuzzy all of a sudden? What's going on there? That's weird. Oh, there we go. Okay. Maybe it was the focus. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, Archangel number eight, if you like Punisher, if you like cool supernatural twists and things like that, it's grim, it's gritty, it's mature, it's got great thematic relevance. It's Michael Morisi, it's C.P. Smith. This was really, really good. I thought it was a super solid book. My number nine, Alienated number two from Boom Studios. Boom Studios has been killing it lately, and Alienated is one of those books that I wasn't necessarily looking forward to in their line, but it's proven to be just as good as something like Something's Killing the Children, or Red Mother, or Once in Future, or Ghosted in L.A. This book is very enticing, and it's really built solidly, solidly on a foundation of absolutely great, compelling, and relatable characters. Right, The characters really blossom, get fleshed out in issue number two. Um, issue number one had a great hook, but issue number two really kind of takes it further. Um, it gets you a little bit more interested in the inconvenience of the situation. This is about these three kids from three completely different backgrounds, all in high school. They find this alien artifact in the woods, um, and all of a sudden now they're connected telepathically. So they can read each other's thoughts and feel each other's feelings and... This does some really great stuff in issue number two of building up this story, building up those characters, making it relatable and excitable. The artwork, so this is written by Simon Spurrier. The artwork by Chris Wildgoose is great. The coloring is vibrant. It's nice, crisp, clean line work, but it's also got a, dyna a dynamic feel and flow to it. The lettering is top-notch in this book. Sometimes when they're talking to each other in their head space, they have a uh, different colored text and uh, it's to help you understand a little bit more specifically who's talking to who and all that stuff. My number nine book of the week, Alienated. My number eight book of the week, Wasted Space number 15. Um, I did a live stream on Monday night where I talked about Archangel 8. I talked about Hexagon. Hexagon, for instance, didn't make the top 10, but it's such another great book from Michael Morisi this week. You got to check out. Wasted Space number 15 wraps up the third arc of Wasted Space. There's going to be five arcs <clears throat> so that's super super cool but it does it in a very great way not only does it end not only do they just nail the ending of the third arc it really is a crucial turning point in the story as far as the lives 
and, uh, and, and, and relationships between the characters. You get revelations, you get lots of cool setup, and an ending that has me just begging for this book to come back as soon as possible. Wasted Space remains one of my favorite comic books on shelves, one of my favorite sci-fi comic books of all time. Hayden Sherman and Jason Wordy on the artwork. Oh my goodness. Textured, detailed, gritty, and, and expressive. And it's exactly what this book needs to be. Number eight is Wasted Space from Vault Comics. My number seven is another AWA upshot book. It's Hotel. Number one, maybe Hotel Hell, maybe, I don't, I don't know. This is written by John Lees with artwork by Dalibor Talajic. The best I got. This is the best I got, right? But this is my number seven comic book of the week. Another great debut from AWA. This is written by John Lees. John Lees is the writer of Mountainhead, which is a really great book coming out from IDW right now. Three issues are out so far. They're amazing. He's also the writer of Sync, which is a book from Comics Tribe. And is it just Comics Tribe? Is Source Point involved in that? I don't know. But Sync is a great horror anthology. That's what this one's going to be. This is a four-issue series called Hotel. It's about a hotel that has four rooms in it, and totally effed up stuff is happening um, in each one of these rooms. And each issue is going to focus on the individual story of the room, meanwhile tying it all into an overall narrative and connectedness. Um, really great stuff. I loved it. If you loved Sync, if you like Mountainhead, definitely check this one out. If you like Ice Cream Man, check this one out. This one's a really wicked and wild, horrific horror story. Really good stuff. Hotel, number one, my number seven book of the week. At number six, we got Black Stars Above, number five. This is the final issue of Black Stars Above from Vault Comics. Oh my goodness, this book was amazing. So, I've had an interesting relationship with Black Stars Above. Number, <laughs> um, I read it the first issue and I really loved it. I love the Lovecraftian cosmological horror approach to it. Um, actually, Jenna Cha, the artist, and Lonnie Nadler... The writer, they just released, Vault's doing this uh, online comic con since all these cons are getting canceled and postponed, um, including our own Huntsville Comic and Pop Culture Expo. It's got moved back to July, and we'll see what happens. Um, but anyway, this one is such a fun book. I'm really liking it, right? But I have an up and down with it. Sometimes I felt like it got a little too complicated, a little too intricate, but then at other times I thought this was amazing. Now, overall, now this is the final issue. The ending of this book is exactly what it should be and it's expected and unexpected at the same time it's great it's first of all the entire the entire the entire run has had amazing artwork by jenna Shaw with coloring by brad simpson and if you watch that video they talk about their influences and it makes a lot of sense like i can't remember his name gustav something the guy that did uh, the dante's inferno those wood etching like type paintings or, or not paintings but like images and whatnot um fantastic stuff i have a copy of dante's and uh divine comedy that have those illustrations and it's definitely inspiring here i didn't show you any of the artwork from the other ones i didn't do that did i but this book is amazing um they mentioned the oh, so basically it's about this fur trapper in the late 1800s in canada she gets this package and she can take it across the wilderness and and deliver it and in the package is like this weird like lovecraftian type cosmological horrific little baby yoda and but the artwork is intricate detailed uh, it's got texture to it. The coloring adds to the mood and atmosphere. The book nailed the ending. And it's one of those things where, even though I wasn't completely into every single issue, I mean, I was, but I also kind of felt lost, challenged, confused, right? But the ending was amazing. I cannot wait. I'm probably this weekend, if I can find all my copies, I'm going to sit down and read all five issues together. That'd be super, super cool. My number five book of the week is The Resistance, number one, from AWA Comics. That's why I think AWA Upshot, they had a really good, solid debut. So The Resistance is a new book by J. Michael Straczynski and Mike Diodato. Uh, Mike Diodato is a great artist, so obviously you get some really hyper-realistic type artwork, some interesting composition and great layouts, some really cool stuff with how he tells the story across the, the, the page and, and affects the timing and the pacing and everything like that, right? This is a very scary book right now with everything crazy going on in the world. So this is a book about a crazy pandemic that comes out and it's just super massive and it's mowing down the population and it acts fast and it's super, super scary. Then it kind of goes away. But the people that got the, 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 uh, the disease, the virus, and lived, right, they developed superpowers. So at the end, it starts veering a little bit like this sounds like another Rising Stars. And I saw a comment about this and I'll tell you this. It's not that I didn't like Rising Stars. I loved Rising Stars when it first started. I really did, right? 
but I really feel like it kind of petered out. Now, maybe it was the delays in all the productions. This is just a six-issue series, at least initially. So I was really excited for this. I like the setup at the end. Um, I thought the book was very effective at telling its story, and maybe it was impacted by what's going on right now with just maybe it helped the urgency of the book or the the sense of of panic and fear because maybe we've seen some things like that in the last few bits or whatever but the resistance number one is a really solid comic book debut for a mini series it's a little scary it's a little really on the nose of the, the 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 zeitgeist right now but it was a really solid book with great artwork and really really compelling writing that really did a great job of setting up the story the characters and it did it in a very excellent way my number four pick of the week and for those of you just joining us, I'm going right through my top 10 real quick. And then afterwards, for people on the replay that don't want to see all the extra nonsense, we'll, we'll all participate in extra nonsense together while I'll take a look at the comments and see who's here. My number four is X-Ray Robot number one. This is a Michael Allred book, and I'm a big Michael Allred fan. If you don't like things like Madman, if you don't like his Fantastic Four run or his FF run, if you don't like Mike Allred's work, you're not going to like this. But this book is amazing, especially if you love Mike Allred. Mike Allred is a fantastic artist, and I love his weird, kooky, wild stories. This is right along the veins of something like Madman or something like that. He's got a very crisp, clean, retro, poppy 60s style. I totally dig that. I would love to see him on the Fantastic Four book again, doing the Fantastic Four book proper. But this is a really cool book, and what it is is about this dude who is trying to, he's a scientist, he's some kind of brilliant scientist, and he's trying to explore um, other dimensions. So he, he creates this, um, everything keeps sliding. He, uh, or at least in my head it keeps sliding. Um, he creates this uh, robot, right, with like this weird like brain inside or something like that, and he, he's, he can pilot the robot remotely using his mental acuity in this machine, right? And so he sends the robot to go flying through the, the, all the dimensions of the multiverse, and he somehow gets connected to this robot. It becomes this weirdly weird, wacky, wild time reality trip and psychedelic and all that stuff. And if you're a big fan of all that kind of jazz, I definitely would recommend that you pick that one up. It's my number four pick of the week. My number three is Something is Killing the Children, number six. The start of the second arc, James Tiny and the Fourth, Werther Del Editera, and Miguel Muerto. What a great book. This book holds no punches back. It's got great atmospheric coloring. It's got amazing composition on the artwork. The double-page spreads really help spread out the dialogue from James Tinian. Sometimes he can be a little overly verbose. This is very, very simply just fast-paced. Fantastic stuff. Really like it. Nuance, lots of mystery, developing, deepening. We're finding out more about Erica, that character right there. Really great stuff. That's a fire cover. Something is Killing the Children took everything by storm last year and continues to do so in the second arc. This is my number three pick of the week. My number two, The Red Mother, number four. I am in love with this book. You know, we did the uh, best comic books um, of the month, the monthly YouTube comic book meetup last month at the end of February. We were all talking about Red Mother. And we started getting the idea, especially in issue number three with the puzzle box and all that kind of stuff, that it felt very Hellraiser. And I said, because even in Hellraiser, Pinhead and the rest of the Cenobites, they don't actually show up until well into the movie. And even from that point forward, they don't show up very often. But when they show up, it's really scary, it's super freaky, and it's very impactful and effective. That's what's going on with Red Mother. It's a little bit of a slow burn, but it's a great nuanced take on a post-traumatic stress. This woman has been attacked. Um, her boyfriend is missing slash maybe presumed dead. She doesn't know what's going on. Nobody can help her out. She lost an eye. She got a replacement. Now she's seeing weird visions. There's some kind of weird, creepy thing stalking her. I love the artwork from Danny Luckert. Each issue starts with that four page, I mean that four panel, like all red type thing, and it keeps getting closer and closer. In this issue, we take the story just a little bit further, revealing a little bit of information, but setting up a whole lot more mystery. The artwork is clean and crisp with excellent coloring. Jeremy Hahn does such a great job of perfectly pacing the script with the dialogue and the flow of it. Everything about this book works. It's creepy, it's cool, and when those moments that are super scary, when they happen, it really happens. It really happens. And my number one, we all know, because you already watched the weekly comic book review, my number one pick of the week is Undone by Blood, or The Shadow of a Wanted Man, number two, from Aftershock Comics. This book is amazing. Written by Lonnie Nadler and Zach Thompson, with artwork by Sammy Cavella, Jason Wordy on the coloring, Hassan Otsman El Howe on the lettering. That is an all-star creative team, okay? 
and they're letting us know. Now, I've said a lot about this already on the weekly comic book review, but basically what I want to say now is this is a great modern Western and classic Western because it's telling two different Western revenge stories, one modern, one classic. She's reading a book. She's the modern story. She's reading a book that's a more classic, appropriate um, to the genre um, Western revenge story, and they both thematically tie into each other. It's a little bit like the Don Treader story in The Watchmen, but maybe not quite as complex, but maybe it is. This book's really good. It's got great artwork, too, by Sammy Cavella. This dude is a master at composition. Look at those pages. Look at the way he sets up these stories. You don't have to do these things like this. Look at how he's using prison bars for maximum effect there. Look how he's using the gutters to represent prison bars sometimes. Look at that right there. Look at that. Some really great stuff going on here. Then it switches to the old school story. Like, look at that. Look at how the prison bars are the panels, and it's just absolutely fantastic. And then once we get to the more classic-natured story um, that she's reading in the book, um, you see how the colors by Jason Wordy shift from a very gritty, um, grimy, more modern and dirty feel to a more classic, pulpy, but still capturing that grime and that grit of a typical Western revenge story. The book balances both of these stories excellently well. It's very direct. It's not subtle at all, but it's also subtle a little bit, though, in its theme. So I just contradicted myself, but who cares? The book is amazing. I think it's absolutely fantastic. You should definitely check it out. Undone by Blood number two was significantly better than issue number one, and issue number one was fire. So that was my top 10 comic books of the week. Let me know down below or right now in the live, live chat, what were your favorite comic books of the week? Let's keep the conversation going. I've been rocking Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on digging and reading and all that stuff. But don't worry, we're not done. So now we just have a live stream. How are y'all doing? Y'all keeping safe, being prepared, taking all necessary precautions, social distancing, staying sane, paying attention to your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health, all that jazz. Everybody got food, toilet paper? How's everybody doing? I know we got a, a global audience. Let's see who's in here. What's up, Mitch? What's up, S Squared? How are you doing? How are things in France? What's up, Sam? Thank you. I'm digging all the live shows, too. This is fun. I, I could almost be tempted to make a habit of this. Doing a lot of live shows, but come on. Aftershock, great stuff. Had a great week, too. Hey, Brian, Red Mother and Something Killing the Children were solid. Yes, Boom had a lot of solid releases. They had a new one called Wicked Things that was actually pretty good, too. So all their releases were great this week. <laughs> Power Rangers TMNT, number four. Come on. S squared says, I will receive my DC comics and some indies thanks to my second LCS who can make deliveries. Cool. Good to hear. What's up, Chris? What's up, Carl? How are you doing? Hey, Chad's here from 90MF Comics. How are you doing, my friend? Robbie, let me know if you can spare any digital codes. Let me know. That's how I'm staying curtain. Current. Curtain? Curtains? That's how he's staying curtains since canceling the pool. Absolutely. I'll let you know. I'll take a look after the show. And we need to chat about, you know, what we were talking about la uh, last time. Was that Monday night, I guess? What's up, Dodora? Carl says, I would like to find a copy of AWA's Archangel 8, number one. A comic shop that delivers. That's cool. Um, my comic shop delivers the deep comics and games. You can find us on Facebook. You can email us at thedeepcomics at yahoo.com. Um, we'll ship comics as well. That's what we're doing right now. Um, we do not have any copies of Archangel 8, number one, though. I got the one I just showed you, but that's my personal copy. And I'm a big Michael Morisi fan, but if you want it too so much, man, maybe. <laughs> a comic shop that delivers, though. Yeah, that is cool. JMS can write challenging stories like Midnight Nation or Amazing Spider-Man The Other. The Other was interesting, but it never really went anywhere because Marvel never quite committed to it from that point forward. That's not JMS's fault, obviously. Um, and I love Midnight Nation. I think Midnight Nation is splendid. I'm not talking smack about JMS. I love Midnight Nation. And I really did like Rising Stars at first. When I say it gets a little Rising Stars at the end, I'm not trying to say it in a, in a negative way, but maybe in a way of, we've been there before? Maybe do something different? But it really starts feeling... Some of that vibe. In fact, now it almost makes me think that maybe I should switch it and Black Star's above, but I don't even think about it too much. 
What's up, Samuel? What's up, Bakari? Hey, what's up, Chris? My first live show, but love the Facebook group and the videos. Well, thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate it. And thank you for being a part of the PCP Army. By the way, y'all, if you're not a part of the PCP Army, you definitely need to go ahead and do that. You can join the PCP Army on our Facebook. That's our Facebook group. We also have a page on Facebook, Pop Culture Philosophers. You can like us there. You can follow me on Twitter at the Rock and Robbie. Um, we got an Instagram account. It's pretty much my Instagram account, but it's called Pop Culture Philosophers. Um, I usually just post my picks of the weeks and uh, pictures of me, like you know, at the comic shop, and being like, "Hey, you know, uh, comic shop, you know, whatever." Um, but all that stuff and more. We're also on Patreon if you want to help support the channel. But I know things are getting crazy. Everybody needs to kind of calm down. But the people that are supporting us on Patreon, thank you so much. We really do. They're their names right there. And we just got a newbie. We just got a new patron um, this week. So it's super cool. Thank you so much for that. So from this point forward, we'll chat about whatever, and we'll talk about just whatever you want to talk about. One of the reasons why I'm doing live streams so much right now is I just want to stay connected, say what's up, make sure everybody's doing good, see the same familiar faces and names out there, and let you know that everything's hunky-dory here in northern Alabama. The crazier it seems to get, and we are not near the end of all of this craziness. You hear the, the news about free comic book day? Did y'all hear about that? The idea right now, and this may change, but the idea is that free comic book day is now going to be free comic book May. So that they're going to, because the books are already printed, so they're like, well, we'll just, <clears throat> the idea is that they'll slowly distribute them out throughout the month of May, and each week there will be another small batch of free comic books to get. This may hurt people that kind of depend on that day and have big events and big sales and all that kind of stuff. Free Comic Book Day for us is always a big, huge event, and, and it's something that we have a lot of fun and we look forward to. Um, I think the best thing to do would be actually to postpone Free Comic Book Day until everything kind of settles out. Even if it takes months, I think that's the best thing to do. Because the idea of Free Comic Book Day, yeah, the free comic books are cool. But y'all, let's be honest. Most of those free comics are okay. We really go there for the event, to socialize with our fellow nerds, and comic book fans, we go there to participate in great deals and sales and, and exclusives and all kinds of stuff like that. So I think they should postpone it. So we'll see what happens, though. I have to have all my comics mailed because there is no LCS in my town anymore. That sucks, Chris. A town without a local comic shop sucks. That that's that's lame. I mean not I mean, it's not obviously you know, I'm just saying that sucks. I hate to see that. <clears throat> I will receive Archangel Eight in my delivery. Very curious to read it. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Now it took me my second read to really kind of get into it. Um, initially, I liked Hexagon more, and that's another one. I wish I had that with me, but another really great one from Michael Morisi this week is Hexagon. It is straight up the last Starfighter, but it is worth it, and it is so well done. It's got a manga influence on the artwork, and it's very kinetic, um, and it's fun and youthful and vibrant. Um, but the story, even though it's straight up the last Starfighter, it was really cool, and Michael Morisi can do that. In his book, I showed my copy of it Monday night, but in his book, Black Star Renegades, it's Star Wars. It is totally Star Wars, but it feels more like a tribute than a ripoff. Does that make sense? Sam says, my LCS here in Montgomery is staying open and doing curbside and shipping. If you can't come into the store, best thing to do is set up a pool box at your local comic shop. Sam, I'm right there with you. We are staying open right now. We are open today. We were a little bit busier than I thought we would be earlier. I think more people need to kind of just... You know, we're offering curbside, we're offering to, uh, um, uh, shipping, so I think people, in order to follow the guidelines especially of social distancing and trying not to help spread this by being, even carriers, even if you don't get sick, you could be, re you, you could lead it, somebody else to get it and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I have people in my life that I don't want to be exposed to this stuff. So I think it's kind of serious, but that's why we're doing things like curbside. That's why we're doing things like shipping, and some shops are doing delivery. Um, so definitely something to, we all want to support the small businesses. We really want to do that and keep the comic shops open because business is taking a hit, you know, but we also want to pay attention to 
you know, bartenders and, and, and servers and, and re- restaurant workers and movie theater workers, you know, and stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of people that are going to be out of work or having uh, their pockets hit. And so there's a, it's a crazy time. But if you can, if your shop's got those kind of programs, I would highly suggest that you take advantage of them if you want to. Um, that's the way to do it. Do the curbside, get your book shipped, but you can still find something to read without actually going um, too far into public. But these are crazy, crazy times. This is unprecedented. There's never been anything like this. It's nuts. Strange times with Diamond giving a green light for sale of books on Tuesday. Don't think that has happened before. I think it happened maybe one time before, like only just because there was like, like an early release for one book and then they said you could go ahead and sell them all or something like that. But yeah, it doesn't really happen. But they're doing it because some states in the United States and then some countries um, around the world have mandated closures of non-essential businesses. Now, let's be honest, a comic book store is a non-essential business, right? So is a movie theater. But they are important things to our economy, um, especially small business economy as far as local comic shops go. Um, So... Yeah, I think they had, especially with some places that were going to be forced to close, I think they wanted to give everybody kind of just a head start because who knows what's going to happen. This thing, this whole thing seems to be day to day right now. And I think that's how it's going to be. We've all read about it forever, but never thought we'd actually witness it. I agree. I was I was noticing because we were talking about resistance and I was like, resistance is a bit it's kind of topical and scary and Bueller's been talking about Pandemica and actually picked up those issues and I'm I don't really want to get into them right now um but yeah it's crazy crazy times you got some people panicking you got some people super scared you got some people thinking it's all just BS and then you got people in the middle just like yo can we just like listen to the guidelines and just hope that we can you know (laughs) that everything will be fine in a little bit come on but you know it is what it is it's crazy. Everybody take care of yourselves and your loved ones. And even your less loved ones. And Samuel, I just don't think Free Comic Book Day, I don't think it would be canceled, but I think maybe postponing it. Because maybe, I don't, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But if, I would not rule out the idea that Free Comic Book Day may, or Free Comic Book May, gets postponed too. You know, but I know that a lot of comic publishers have spoken out about this. Vault and Image and a few others, um, they have decided some of them to kind of stagger their release schedule because they know that we're hitting, we're probably about to hit an economic hard time here, especially in the United States, right? And they don't want to overload the market with too much content um, when people are going to be maybe struggling to even make their rent or their utility bill or buy food or something like that. So Vault, for instance, is barely releasing anything in April. Um, Image and a few others are also making uh, a lot of their comic books completely returnable. So um, they're making steps, and we'll see what happens. It was Rebirth, wasn't it? It was DC Rebirth. When they did DC Rebirth, they were going to do the early schedule, and they just said everybody can go ahead and sell them. Maybe I'll take the time to finish my Invincible Compendiums. Yeah. You know, I've only ever read like the first 12 issues of that, so maybe I should do the same. I'm looking to get into some lock and key, though. Just recently completed that run. I'm looking forward to checking out that. That'd be neat. Maybe some old school New Warriors. Y'all hear the stuff about New Warriors today? Well, that's divisive, isn't it? (laughs) Then you have Florida. Oh, my goodness, you have Florida. You see all those people on the beach. I mean, I'm not telling people not to do what they want to do, but that's crazy. I, I would... I would not be out on the beach right now. That's just me. That's just me, though. I've been indoors the entire time, except for when I'm at work or the couple times over the last few days I've been at the grocery store. But I don't play around. I've read too much science fiction. I don't play around. They tell me to stay inside. I'm just going to stay inside. I don't care. Even if they didn't tell me to stay inside, I'd do it. (laughs) 
Rebirth brought me back into comics after a long hiatus. Yeah, it did that for a lot of people. You know, the New 52 actually brought in a lot of people. My homie Lance, he's uh, from Dan's Panda Comics. Um, he got into comic books because of the New 52. You know, there were a bunch of new number ones. He was like, oh, cool. I can finally read Batman, Superman, and all kinds of other stuff, right? So these relaunches have their 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 purpose, and they, they, they bring people into the industry and back into the industry. I'm a FedEx guy dropping packages on the curb like you Domino's Pizza. I completely understand that. That makes total sense to me. I've worked from home for the past five years, so I'm very lucky, but I've had to go shopping for some of my older family, etc., but keeping it limited. Yeah. I think some people need to take it seriously. I think there are a lot of people not taking it seriously, but I'm not trying to tell people what to do, but at the same time, like, I don't know. I would recommend listening to that. If you don't take it too seriously, I'd recommend listening to that Joe Rogan podcast he did with Michael, whatever his name is. It was from last week. Man, I watched that that night, and I was like, hmm, huh. And then it all seemed to start unfolding right after that, and I was like, man. We'll see what happens. I hope everything works out for the best. I hope we get over it soon. That means we we did it right, right? <laughs> I don't know, though. It's crazy. I think everybody just needs to be safe and be concerned and be conscious of what's going on. Pay attention. We are doing a uh, Spawn movie review this weekend, right? And even with just me and Brooks and Jelani, I, I don't know. We may I may see, actually, if they want to... I asked Brooks today. I was like, you got a webcam? He's like, yeah, I got a webcam. I was like, okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll just go live instead of, uh, we'll just go live and talk about it. It'd be fun to get them on a live stream where I don't have to like set up the room for a three piece. Three piece and a biscuit. What's up, hamburger basket? Good evening to you as well. And yes, a shout out to Carl. Good old Carl. Hey, what's up, Marco? Things are as good as can be. Well, Chris, we won't do a live watch party for Spawn because all three of us have already rewatched it, and we don't really necessarily want to do that again right now. <laughs> but I, I, <laughs> so I, I watched Spawn last night. Jelani watched it too. Jelani is, I think, kind of pissed that he wa had to watch Spawn. Uh, me and Brooks are a little bit different-minded, but it's going to be a fun conversation, I'll tell you that. Whether we do it here in the studio or whether we do it live from our respective um, quarters. All PCP lives in one compound. We all have our own like quarters. It's like the Star Trek, the, the Starship Enterprise. That'd be cool, actually, especially if it was the E. The E's the best one. Yeah, we'll do it live. Chris says, I watched Jay and Silent Bob reboot last night for the first time. I actually enjoyed Jay and Silent Bob reboot. I was kind of nervous. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to really like it. But I really did. I thought it was cool. I thought it had a little bit of heart to it. It was dumb. It was cheesy. But, I mean, so is Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. We just did, uh, I watched it because we did uh, the... Uh, super loud um we did a uh a kevin smith podcast and it's a great podcast and if you want to just if you got like uh, two hours to kill and you just want to feel like you're hanging out with us talking about kevin smith movies just listen to that podcast it's on popculturephilosophers.com it's also on uh itunes is what it's called right yeah pete the spawn movie we rewatched the spawn movie from the 90s 97 right michael J. white um Martin Sheen, John Leguizamo. It's something. It's something, it's something, it's something. It would lead to a conversation. Let's have this conversation. What are some great movies that have, I mean, what are some not-so-great movies that have great soundtracks? I would say Spawn's one of them. And I'm not trying to talk too much smack about Spawn. Spawn was definitely important for its time. And I had a lot of fun on the revisit. And I'm going to have a lot of fun talking about it with Brooks and Jelani. But... 
Spawn had a better soundtrack than it was a movie. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. I, Mortal Kombat Annihilation is another one. That's an excellent soundtrack in a terrible movie. What are some badass soundtracks for not-so-badass movies? We also plan on watching Cats soon because that's available digitally now. I like how the how 90s the music video on that DVD is. When people ask me what the 90s were after were long after the next apocalypse, I'll show them that video of Trip Like I Do by Filter and Crystal Method. I love that song. Can't you, can't you trip like I do? I love that damn song. I really do. Uh, I also love the Marilyn Manson Sneaker Pimp song. Long Hard Road Out of Hell? Hell yeah. And when you rewatch the movie, it's always fun to see Todd McFarlane show up. <laughs> oh man. Spawn the movie. That's that's fun stuff, y'all. That's fun stuff. Anyone remember Cat People with the Black Panthers? I do remember Cat People. Cat People is a cool movie. I remember liking it. It'd be a little, it'd be a little weird. S Square says I read the transference trade from Maurice. I got that in my shop today. I didn't pick it up yet, um, but I'm looking forward to checking it out. I didn't even realize it was a thing till you posted it in the PCP Army. I did get my Sex, Death, and Revolution today though, so that's cool. Yeah, I got a few Black Mask books to read. I need to read My Devil's Do, which is a black AF book um, by Vita Ayala and Liana Kangas. I'm really bummed out that our expo, of course, got postponed, but hoping she can make the next date because we're really looking forward to that. Um, I got to read The Wild by Vita Ayala. I got to read Kim and Kim. Um, lots of Black Mass stuff to check out. And yeah, that Sex, Death, and Revolution, I'm excited to see how it wraps up because I was following that as it was going. Then they decided, you know what, we're just going to release a graphic novel. Black Mask. Come on, y'all. What is the status with the new Spawn movie? Well, Hamburger Basket, as this is my understanding of the situation. There's 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 studio and production company. They want to do it. They 100% want to do a Spawn movie. Todd McFarlane 100% wants to do a Spawn movie. Todd McFarlane wants complete creative control. He disagrees with production companies and studio Movie doesn't happen. They did cast Jamie Foxx at one point, but so much time has elapsed that it's all up in the air. But right now, it seems like the studio and production companies want to make a more darker superhero movie, which is what the original Spawn movie is. is it's a dark superhero movie for its time. In 97, that's how superhero movies were made, and it's darker than Batman, in a way, and, and very edgy. <laughs> Very edgy. Um, but McFarlane wants to make this a horror movie. He really wants to lean into the horror aspect and away from the superhero aspect. It seems like there's a clash there, but unless McFarlane's on board, it ain't going to happen. And that's what happens when you have 100% creative control of your creation. I think Jamie Foxx could totally nail it. I think he could do a great job there. The ending was good on Sex, Death, and Revolution. That's super cool. I'm very excited. to Check it out. Chris, I have not read any Stabity Bunny yet. I, 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 I'd like to. I like Scout Comics. I think they do some good stuff. I really like Category Zero from them. That was a great one. Thank you for the heads up on a lot of titles. I wouldn't be aware otherwise. Wolfman's got Nards. First of all, just the best, the best YouTube name. Come on. But you're welcome. I'm glad I can help you out. The Spawn movie's having the same kind of production as Doomsday Clock had. <laughs> That's funny. I've been reading old issues. I guess you're trying, yeah. old Or just odd. He's just reading the odd issues. So one, three, five, seven, nine... Been reading issues of Avatars Crossed. Wasn't there a Prodigy song on the Spawn soundtrack? I would really like to see a new Spawn movie. Yes, there was a Prodigy song on that soundtrack. That's great. Does anybody have anything else? Like, what's a great soundtrack to a bad movie? 
There's got to be more than Spawn and and Mortal Kombat Annihilation, right? He's Street Fighter, right? What's up, Chris? How are you doing? What'd you miss? Um, I did my top ten, so you can catch that on the replay. And now we're just kind of bullshitting. We've been talking about the Spawn movie. <laughs> Right now, I'm asking everybody, what's a great soundtrack but a bad movie? I would almost say The Faculty, but I like The Faculty. But at the same time, I kind of like Spawn. So maybe that one too. Batman Forever. Mikey. That's a great one. Batman Forever has an amazing soundtrack, right? That Seal song, the Offspring song. That's a great soundtrack. Batman and Robin has a great soundtrack. There's another one. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Good pick. Good, good, good looking. Blade 3. Blade Trinity. <laughs> both Blade movies. The first two. I say both, but there's like, there's, like, there's only two. There should only be two, right? Um, almost said The Crow, but I actually like that movie. See, I'm not the biggest Crow fan, but I did just pick up the original James O'Barr Crow series. Um, really beat up copies, so that's why I was able to pick them up because they were kind of cheap. So I'm looking forward to reading it. My homie uh, G-Funk used to always try to get me to read that. He's a huge O'Bar fan. But I just never took it seriously. Judgment Night. I'm not familiar with that one. Hey, Robbie. Hey, what's up, CMA Thunder? Sure, it's been said already, but loving this live feed. Thanks again for your work and Maximum Overdrive. Maximum Overdrive with the Green Goblin diesel truck. Hell yeah. Huh. There's probably a lot of them from the 80s, probably, to be honest. Escape from L.A., you're right. You're right. It's a shitty movie, but it's a great soundtrack. I don't know what this Judgment Night is. I'm going to have to check that out. Cyborg. Cyborg's got a badass soundtrack. It's a terrible movie. The, the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. There's another one. Judgment Night was a bunch of suburban guys ending up in a rough area and witnessing something they shouldn't. Mm. Interesting. Blending hip-hop and rock on each track. Okay. Heck yeah. Yeah, Spawn did that whole thing where they, they had like a like a rock group Mixed up with like some kind of techno group. You know, they brought in Sneaker Pimpers and uh, Sneaker Pimpers. Sneaker Pimpers? They brought in the Sneaky Pimpers, the Sneaker Pimps, and Marilyn Manson together. And there was a, the big falling out that happened over that. Um, Crystal Method and Filter. Um, Prodigy. And was it Tom Morello that did the Prodigy song? Or who did, who was the song, who was on the Prodigy song with them? I don't remember. Now, Blade did. I remember, I love the Blade soundtrack. I was listening to this just the other day, actually. So the first half of the Blade soundtrack is all like techno dance type stuff, and then the second half is all hip-hop. No, I reversed that. The first half is all hip-hop. The second half is all like dancey, techno-y stuff. Um, hey, what's up, Two-Gun Pedro? Pew, pew. Does everybody, does everybody do that when you show up on their live streams? Because I, I see a lot of people that do that. <laughs> and it's, not, it's just something that we all do because everybody loves finger guns, right? <laughs> Slayer and Ice T, hell yeah! But uh, Blade Two actually did the thing where they took they took the techno artist and mixed them with a hip hop artist. I remember that one. How about a great soundtrack in an all time great movie, Drive? I've never seen that, but does it have the Cars song on it? Because if not, then it's not a good soundtrack. And the Amazing Booyah Tribe and Faith No More. Okay. Onks. Slam. Da, 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 da. Let the boys be boys. Hell yeah. That's my time. <laughs> That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Uh, what else can we talk about? <laughs> if anybody just got here, though, I'll do another super quick rundown of my top 10 of the week. Lots of great books. Number 10, Archangel 8. Number 1 from AWA. Number 9, Alienated. Number 2 from Boom. Number 8, Wasted Space. Number 15 from Vault. Number 7, Hotel from AWA. Number 1. 
Number six, Black Stars Above, number five, from Vault. Number five, The Resistance, number one, from AWA. Number four, X-Ray Robot, number one, from Dark Horse. Number three, Something is Killing the Children, number six, from Boom. Number two, The Red Mother, number four, from Boom. And number one, Undone by Blood, number two, from Aftershock. What was y'all's favorite book that you read if you picked up your books this week? No spoilers, but what was your favorite comic book you read this week? What was your pick of the week? Chris, that X-Ray Robot was cool. Did you read it? Heck yeah, Chad. Working and watching. Hell yeah. Dude, that Something is Killing the Children variant was nice. We had that at the shop, and now the book's damn popular, so the variant was a little expensive. Uh, that was a beautiful cover. I really like the uh, I really like the main cover, too. And then there was a... They do a like a textless one, but I really like the bold text on that, man. Uh, I really loved just the Something is Killing the Children. <laughs> I really like it. That's great. All of it, great covers, though. Great covers have been the norm for that book. No, Something is Killing the Children is not done. This is the start of the second story arc, where we're going to get more information about Erica, where she's from, House of Slaughter, all that jazz. When you're caught up, you'll let me know what your pick of the week is. <laughs> Please do let me know what your specific pick of the week was, was for this week, when you're completely caught up. Yeah, that's a great cover. Not a comic, but I've been reading A Night in Lonesome October this week, and it's fantastic, would make a great comic. I haven't heard of that. That sounds cool. I've been reading Song of Susanna, but I haven't gotten to it in like a week or so. Tiny in the Third is on a roll? What's he written? I know Tiny in the Fourth. It is Tiny in. And I've been telling everybody it's Tiny in. Tiny in. And it was great to see Bueller get corrected on his video with Justin Richards where Justin told him, it's Tinyan. You got to trust me, Bueller. I'm telling you. I don't pronounce all the names right, but I was very certain of that because I said Tinian for years as well. Because <laughs> it sounded like straight up like something out of like Game of Thrones or something. Lord James Tinian the <laughs> Fourth. Yeah, the frizzing cover with the chainsaw. Hell yeah. The 3D images at the end of X-Ray Robot are bad, or rad. Glad I have some 3D glasses to check them out. Yeah, I have to find some because I saw that and noticed it. Um, Alred loves the 3D. Did you read his Madman 3D? Chris, have you read the like Madman and stuff? I was showing off my Atomics number one not too long ago um, and loved it. I love Mike Alred's stuff. I really do. I can't get through 47 comics in just one sitting, so Undone by Blood and Undiscovered Country. Undiscovered Country was a really solid issue, too. I think that one's been getting better and better as it progresses. Undone by Blood was absolutely amazing. And I know not everybody can get through 47 comics in one season, in one sitting. It takes dedication, trust me. People are always asking me how I do it. You just do it. I mean, it's, my whole day is planned around that. 47 is a little excessive, though. I don't necessarily like reading 47 comics back-to-back -back and trying to remember them all and, and discuss them all in one quick video. Somehow, I did a video, like, last week or the week before, and I was only covering, like, less than 30 books, and that video was, like, 45, 47 minutes long. And this video, I'm doing 47 books, and it was 40, it was, uh, 40 minutes long. I'm like, how in the hell? But I think I knew I was trying to get through some of them pretty quickly. As of right now, reading Reminder's Venom Run, so good. I think it starts off really solid, kind of weakens out a little bit for me, um, especially when Cullen Bunn jumps in. But at the same time, I was completely um, biased because I did not like Flash Thompson being Venom. Um, I want Venom to be Eddie Brock, and I'm so happy now. But uh, there was some really great thematic material in that book and some great character work, actually. You can't deny, I can't deny the great character work that was done by Reminder. Um, on Flash Thompson in that run. I 
I don't think it is the best of the week, but my soft spot for Bachalo art means I have to say my pick is Deadpool number four. I hate him usually, but his art is gorgeous and reminds me of early Generation X. I'm a big Bachalo fan as well. I think the artwork's amazing. I'm not typically a Deadpool fan. I do like Bachalo and I do like Thompson's work. Um, so I read the first couple issues, but it just wasn't working for me. And I definitely, even if I was reading it, I would have skipped it this week with so many books. There were a lot of great independent books, y'all. But yeah, I'm right there with you. I don't really like Deadpool either. Haven't read Madman, read some of his stuff, just finished his Bowie book. Oh, man, I want that Bowie book. It looks amazing. I tried to order extra copies, and they were already out, so hopefully I'll get a hold of one. Oh, Eddie uh, Anti-Venom was cool, but it was very short-lived. Right, very short-lived. Batman number 91 was amazing. My pick of the week, Joker killed it. Yeah, that, that Jorge Jimenez killed that Joker scene. That Joker scene was wicked, crazy, awesome-looking, cool. Holy cow. But it was another great issue. Tiny is really... <laughs> I'm glad that book has had an, an enormous turnaround in sales and reception. The reveal of Spider King was what really hooked me. Hell yeah, that was a cool that was a cool bit. Unbelievable how many great indie titles came out this week. Looking forward to reading all four upshot releases. Yeah, yeah. They were really solid. Red Border was okay in my estimation, but the other three were supremely solid. I really like it. But you got JMS, you got Maurice, you got John Lees. You got some good talent there behind that, so really cool. Can't argue that Eddie Anti-Venom was short-lived. Yeah, if they would have just kept Eddie there, that would have been cool and interesting to me. And I always wanted to have it so that, like, this is what I would have done. Right. So I and I told everybody this all the time back in those days when that was coming out. What I would have done is I would have had Flash do great stuff and basically do a very similar character arc with Flash as Venom. But the symbiote just continues to like overpower and break that control and go crazy. And that's some stuff that kind of happened. Right. But I would have really leaned into it heavy and I would have had Eddie getting the symbiote back be almost like a sacrifice. Like, Eddie was done with the symbiote, didn't want to be back, but realized that he was pretty much the only person who could kind of keep it in control. That's what I would have done. But regardless, Eddie Brock is Venom again, and I'm very happy. The Allred Bowie book is cool. I love music and comics. I'm a big record collector and music nerd. Hell yeah. He did a, uh, a book... What was it called? Was it Red Rocket 7 or something like that? I never read it, but it was about like a band and there was music that went along with it. Oliver's really big into that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's you definitely may I think it's called Red Rocket 7 maybe, but uh you d I think you should definitely look into that one. And it's uh it's in a different format where it's like the book is like this and opens up this way, I believe, if I remember correctly. But I've never read it myself. He was also the original artist on Bluntman and Chronic. He's uh he's the he's the Holden McNeil and Banky Edwards. It's Mike Allred. Need to catch up on Batman. I had to cancel the pool as Tinian took over. Tinian? Jesus. As Tinian took over, I hopped on issue 67, King Ruin Batman for me. I legit tried to give him a chance, but after 60 or something issues, I was done. The Tinian stuff's been really good. It's been really interesting. JMS on a book that is only six issues makes me happy. I love JMS so much, but sometimes my hair grows gray before he wraps up a single plot line. I dig that. So yeah, I was, that's why I said like, even at the end, I'm starting to get a rising stars vibe. As long as we know this isn't going 24 issues, it's going six. So it seems like this is something that could be a little bit more streamlined and efficient, which would have it, let it have more impact. I think rising stars would have had more impact if it was only 12 or 15 issues. Think about it. And, of course, the delays. The delays hurt it like crazy. So hopefully, with as long as they've been building up to AWA, hopefully these are already done. 
Black Label, The Low Low Woods, and Plunge were awesome. Yes, they were. Low Low Woods was so good this week. It almost made the top 10, but it didn't quite make it because there were just so many good books. Low Low Woods is straight up low-key coming to be one of my favorite Black Label books. Um, there are moments where I just was like, what is going on? And so confused. And then moments where you just truly horrific, like just it's truly horrific, really great stuff. And Plunge Issue 2, I thought, was a was a really, really good, solid book that was even better than the first issue. And the first issue was solid. Love the war of jokes and riddles, but the dreams and the wedding and making Batman this big crybaby just was not for me. It wasn't for a lot of people, Chad. I think it would have been a great run if it was in 50 issues. But it has some inconsistencies. It's up and down. There are moments I love and moments I really don't like. So kind of an inconsistent run though i do plan on sitting down and doing a, a reread of all of it one day because tom king is a very brisk and sparse writer so it's really quick to get through a tom king book and i have found because i was not liking his batman run at all at first you can look at the old videos from like 2016 2017 and i was not digging it then i hit a point where i went back and i reread a whole big big chunk and i really did like it like for instance i hated the War of Jokes and Riddles at first. I hated that. But when I went back and read everything and I got the idea of what he was saying about Batman and who Bruce is as a person, and I really did like The War of Jokes and Riddles. Like, it worked out for me so well on a reread. So I'm looking forward to rereading everything because I even think it's going to iron out some of the, the crybaby nightmare type stuff towards the end. But we shall see. Gotham Girl and Guy was so bad. You know, I, I don't mind that initial arc. I actually didn't mind that. And I thought I thought that Gotham Girl was a wasted opportunity. There's a lot more opportunity there with Gotham Girl that they didn't quite get into. Oh, the Kite Man. Every, I mean, that Kite Man specific issue was one of the best issues of the entire run. For sure. Hell yeah. If you look behind me, I got my question number one. I'm always talking up the Denny O'Neill, Dennis Cowan, Bill Sienkiewicz run. Well, that's Magyar, by the way, but Sienkiewicz on the cover. Um, there's my number one right there. Love that run. Love that series. There's my New Warriors number one. Always talk about New Warriors. Some interesting New Warriors news today. These two new characters, one's called snowflake and one's called safe space well okay okay marvel we'll see we'll see what happens i'm just happy that we got a, another short-lived new warriors book that's gonna have night thrasher in it so i'm just i'm just happy for that y'all the panel with batman like horse riding the plane was so bad it was so good <laughs> I can I can dig on that. I, I get what you're saying there. All right, I got a few toys here I want to show off. They're Toy Biz toys from like 1989. 1989 Toy Biz had brief moment where they had the rights to the DC figure. So right when the Batman 89 movie came out, they released this figure. Right there. I'm sure a lot of people my age will remember this. Love having this on card. I've had it on card for a while now. I have a loose one too. So cool. This is a Batman movie. I know exactly what panel you're talking about in issue number one. It made me think of uh, of uh, Doctor Strange Love. So there's the Batman right there with the bat rope and all that stuff. So along with that one, I got my Bob the Goon here. Everybody remembers Bob the Goon from the 89 Batman movie. He's got a power kick action. I loved this figure when I was a kid because I loved figures with accessories. He's got a knife, he's got a gun, and he's got a hat. Then there's the Joker figure. I have the Joker figure loose. I have like three of these Joker figures, but they're all loose. I don't have a single one on card. I want it on card so bad. Where is that thing? There's the figure right there. And then Kenner got the line, the rights, and they did the Dark Knight line, and that was super, super cool. But also... They did a DC superheroes line, right? And in that superheroes line, they did some more Bat villains. And then, of course, they did Just League characters like Superman. And they did a Robin. They did 
uh, Wonder Woman, they did The Flash, they did Aquaman, all that stuff, right? And I'm still trying to hunt down some of those, right? But I do get the Bat Villains that they did. So there's the Riddler that they did for that line right there. And you can see right there, there's the Superman and Luther. I have that Luther figure. But yeah, so but this, this Riddler thing is silly. He comes with riddles and clues. Like if you look in there, there's like this... I don't know if you can really see it, but there's these little pieces of paper. See them down there? And they have riddles on them. That's so stupid. I guess they were like, I guess they were like what action figure are we going to give the Riddler? <laughs> Here's the Mr. Freeze figure. This one was badass. You put him in the freezer, and he changes colors. You can see the action right there. I loved this figure when I was a kid. I would love to get this one out of package as well. Then there's the Two-Face figure. I would love to get this one out of package. He flips the coin. You just got to, you know, tw he's got a little knob right there. He'll twist it. But this was, it may not be, but to me, I this was like the first Two-Face figure I remember. There's a little bit more of the whole line right there. You can see they did the Hawkman, Green Lantern, all that stuff. And what I loved about this line, it was like, they were like, nah, we don't need to do a comic book Batman. We'll just do the movie Batman. <laughs> but uh, we'll just give you comic book joke. I mean, Riddler. I mean, uh, Robin, right? But a two-face figure is kind of boring. It has, like, no articulation, but it's a two-face figure. It's a two-face figure that's straight-up 80s. And then there's the penguin right there. They basically took the same mold from the toy, uh, from the Superpowers penguin. It's the exact same thing, but he has a... It's got a different action feature on his umbrella. I have a, an open one. You can kind of see it right there. And I've got the Batman Returns one that Kenner did where they got the exact same thing and they just painted it black and red instead of blue and yellow for the tuxedo and gave him a uh, cool helicopter um, launching umbrella, which was super cool. But I, I pulled those out so I could show them off tonight. Yeah, I know that's a huge-ass coin. I guess it's cool that they did the coin so that you could flip it yourself. The, the Superman figure that came from there had a magnet inside of it and there was a, a kryptonite ring. It was Luther's kryptonite ring. And I believe the Luther figure actually has the ring on. But there's a, a kryptonite ring that you could wear, and it's it's got an opposite polarity of the magnet that's in the Superman. So if you go near the Superman, it will propel the Superman away. I don't have the Superman, but I do have that ring. But I do have the superpower of Superman, which is very similar, but I want to get the one that has the magnet inside of it. Does anybody know of any other um, action figures that use magnets like that? I know the Magneto, the first Magneto that Toy Biz did had magnets where you could put these like pieces of metal on his chest and it was kind of interesting and on his hands. I got that one loose. It's neat. Yeah, no more drugs for CB. Huh. I want that Bob Ha. It's Tracy Walter from Repo Man. It sure is, isn't it? Hell yeah, it sure is. Heck yeah. Well, I appreciate everybody jumping in on the live stream tonight and saying what's up, how you doing, all that jazz and more. Let's see. I just got a message from Bob. Oh, he sent me, uh, looks like the Death Star run done in Legos. I'll have to check that out. That's super cool. All right. We're about to be wrapping up here. Gonna go cook some dinner, chill out, maybe watch the final episode of His Dark Materials because I'm on the final episode and I'm absolutely loving it, loving it, loving it, loving it so much. One episode to go. I'm gonna do a massive rewatch of Clone Wars so I can watch the new season. Um, I've only seen the first two seasons of Clone Wars, so excited to do that. That sounds super cool. I may be going live again tomorrow night. We'll just see what happens. Um, but if I do, it will be around 7 o'clock. Uh, p.m. U.S. Central Time, just like tonight. Um, so I may go live again just to say what's up, give a shout out and say, hey, how are you doing? Stay stay in touch. Everybody, no, Chris, I haven't read the Dark Materials books, but Brooks has, and he tells me they're really, really good. So I do really want to check that out. Oh, no problem. Thank you guys for being here. We really do appreciate it. Thank you for everything that you do, all your support of the channel. Um, popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. Subscribe if you haven't already. Um, we, we do these things and do these live streams checking in. It's kind of fun, really cool. But everybody, be safe. 
Take it seriously. Be cautious. And uh, look out for one another. We'll catch you next time, y'all.